Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to today's session. This is the last official webinar of 2021. We'll just wait a few minutes until a few more people join and then we'll officially get started with the webinar. Let's officially get started now. Today's webinar will be about energy management through motion detectors. It will be around one hour long and it will be presented by Arun and moderated by me. Throughout the webinar, let's make sure that your microphone is muted and cameras are off so we can't hear you during the presentation. Nevertheless, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the session. And if you have any questions, you can just put them in throughout the session and Arun will answer them at the end. If you need help or if something isn't working, please just report it in the chat and I can try my best at helping you. If there's no sound, uh, please just check the settings in the audio tab or just refresh your page and then it will probably be working. We recommend to, uh, to wear a headset to avoid uh, surround sounds or any other disturbances. Also, towards the end of the session, there will be a survey and also a poll to in which you can win an amazing giveaway of AirPods. And uh, lastly, after the webinar is over, a follow-up email will be sent to you with the link to the YouTube re replay and the presentation itself too, if you want to review it again. I will now be handing it over to Arun, who will be conducting the webinar today. Hello everyone. My name is Arun and uh, today, we will have a webinar on this topic, which is specific to energy management through motion detectors. Um, specifically, this topic has been chosen because energy management is a very vast area. And what can be done through energy management is a lot. So today we will restrict our discussion, which is mainly through motion detectors, what we can achieve and probably what are all the types of motion detection and all those is what we will see today. So the agenda today will encompass an introduction. Then we will speak in general about what are all the consumptions of loads, what are the various energy saving concepts which are already prevailing and uh, you know something specific to motion detection, what are all the technologies which are uh, in, in place already. and uh, what's the differences and which is better in certain times. And we then boil down to uh, the PAR technology and see a lot of insights about that. And at the end, have a short discussion about uh, the potential savings, which could be estimated if at all it's possible in those areas. And then finally summarize my webinar session. And we will end as Morris said with a poll and a Q&A session with a feedback. So we now start the introduction of energy management. Most of us would have definitely heard this word energy management. So what, what really is energy management? Is it, is it about 
as not using any energy or not caring about energy no it's it's neither it's about using the energy but adopting or using the latest technology whichever is applicable to then enhance the energy efficiency of a building this is predominantly the point okay so it can be stated in various ways but the nutshell is this we need to find an energy efficient way of handling energy generally speaking there are three main steps which it will involve normally measure monitor and then act uh, people do say you know if we already start measuring we are almost 10 20 percent of the activity done because it will hit us by saying oh so much is the energy we are using what are we doing about it you know and then it's not about one-time measurement it's a period of time which is being monitored and then definitely an action needs to be taken for that you know wherever it's possible and is it at all giving a return off on uh, you know the investment or is it value uh, to do this kind of an action those things need to be checked and an action needs to be taken for sure so in all in all what what we see as the principal objective of this energy management are definitely to conserve the reserves resources we have on a broader picture directly to the individual or the uh, builder or the person who owns the building it's definitely saving a budget which month on month what we are paying even if a percentage reduces from that it's a good good activity and then finally again you know minimizing the carbon footprint so this uh, is a simple explanation of an energy management and we will focus on these points while we discuss this webinar today before we go into details let's keep it a bit general and try to understand what are all the consumption loads you know which which is there in homes or offices and what are all the saving concepts energy saving concepts being used at the moment it could be simple it could be complex but but what all you know so when we look at the load types you know and when we look around our home and offices it would be definitely you know what we see air conditioners they consume a lot of energy in offices as well as at homes. Then you could say even water heaters, they, they do consume uh, energy. Then you would see a lot of lights, even in offices and homes, you know, um, and nowadays it's, it's a good practice to have um, LED lamps indoor and uh, there are a lot of lamps there in each office, even outdoor lights garden lights compound wall lights facade lights then we do have uh, street lights which is um, some cases managed by the government if it is in the roads if it is within within a compound then it becomes common areas for the people who are living in that villas so villa compound has also common areas which is the street lights water pumps definitely all buildings needs water so even if it's a home or office, there is a, a pump system which is running, you know, depending on the need behind the uh, whole picture. So this also consumes a lot of energy. All electrical appliances, you know, in a nutshell to say, yes, they do consume energy, but some more, some less, some all the time, some uh, during a particular period. So it, it varies, but yes, electrical appliances do consume a lot of energy on an overall month, if you look at it. And in the lease and trend, you know, you, you would see uh, electric car charges are also consuming power, thereby we actually charge the car, car. So this is coming under consumption. So we'll also need some ways, you know, how we can actually um, save energy in all these areas. There can be more things, you know, more than this, but uh, these are predominantly the point which we need to start thinking about before going deeper into this webinar. Now, yes, we said, you know, these energy we are using and uh, none of them we can say, no, I don't need it or I won't use it. No. So how efficiently we will use it is the point. So, for example, when we take air conditioners, you know, um, most of the homes or offices do have thermostats, which are temperature based, 
you know, you, you can set a particular temperature and once it reaches that temperature, the AC automatically switches off and then comes again when it gets warmer. So these are simple things, you know, but there is a automatic on and off happening once we give a small input to this device. Uh, these devices have become more and more intelligent these days. So we'll not go deeper into that, but that's a temperature based saving concept, which is being used now. Uh, in many times, you know, um, it's important to decide a time based application. We don't need uh, certain things to happen all the time. Um, let's say, for example, it could be uh, uh, even even a compound wall lights, for example, let's take it on a villa. We just need lights from six in the night and six in the morning. All we need to do is a simple application of a time based uh, time switch, which will do its purpose. If I would have done it manual, I would have probably switched it on at six o'clock. But morning I get up maybe at seven. So I lost one hour of waste energy. So we save, you know, in, in every ways by doing certain uh, concept. So this is a time based concept. Some of them could be even light based, which means there is an optical sensor in it. It will detect the level of light already available either inside that room or externally from sunlight, for example. So when there is enough sunlight, we don't need an additional lamp to give additional light, which can be automated. So this kind of a concept can also be done so that uh, it's not like when some sun rays come in, I go walk and switch off a light. It does it automatically, for example. So these are energy saving concepts and it's happening in front of our eyes and supporting for budget saving. We've even gone to even astronomy based, which means depending on the location, you can actually control the street lights. If you do a, a normal time based for street lights in summer, for example, there is enough sunlight till seven in the evening. So why switch on the lamps, street lamps at six if it's a time based? So put it on astronomy based. It knows the location. And for that location, it even knows, you know, what is the uh, sunrise and sunset time and it will automatically work on that. So it's an astronomy based energy saving concept. Then comes the movement detection concept. Most of the times we need la lights for what, you know, when people are there, you know, some cases only we need lamps when the people are not there. So let's say when we need light only when people are there then motion detection is the best concept to use. Only when people move, only when people come in, light comes on or certain activations happen. So this is based on movement detection. Just some more to complete because we spoke about some energy consumptions like water pumps and things. So water level based and it will automatically check tank level and then automatically switch it off and switch it on when the tank level goes down. And some can be even rain based, you know, when there is this, this doesn't apply too much for our region, but generally speaking, as a concept, it is available. Water sprinklers need not come when there is rain, for example. So, so eventually we are saving electricity and also water based on that. We spoke about this car charging um, mechanism in the earliest slide. So to save some power, it's also good to do tariff based, um, say, charging or usage of certain equipments. Um, many countries have different tariffs at different days or times of the day. So let's say, for example, 11 to 12 is a less peak hour. So it's good to do a car charging during that period or maybe a washing machine running during that period. So these kind of devices are now prevalent where the inputs can be given into it and according to which the equipments will be activated. So you see, you know, there are a lot of energy saving concepts which are already prevalent. And what we are going to do today is to see mainly one of them, which is this movement based application where we will see how and what technologies are available and how this whole activity is being done using motion detection. So we start with trying to understand, you know, what are the types of motion detection technologies available um, let's say, you know, uh, in 90% of the cases which are being commercially used already. So we start with talking about 
Uh, the first one, which is passive infrared technology. Here, this actually um, detects the difference in temperature between the body and the room temperature. And you see a band of light, which is this infrared, you know, and it's not visible to the human eyes. It's on the right side of the red. And this is detectable to these equipments. And this knows that, okay, there is some movement and there is some person and a detection is done. So this is based on um, the temperature difference between the body and the room temperature in the infrared band. The next technology which is used for this moment detection is the ultrasonic. So here it is based on sound, you know, uh, and in the previous one, I also wanted to say it is passive because the device doesn't generate any, any, any IR. It is waiting for the radiation to reach the sensor. So it's the other way around for ultrasonic where the device keeps sending a sound wave. And once it hits an object and it comes back as a reflection, it knows that if something has been moved or a new pattern has been created and then it understands there is a movement. So this is based on ultrasonic. I've just put some pictures on the left side to understand where this audible and non audible bands exist and how it is being harnessed for such kind of devices. Otherwise, we'll keep hearing some sound, you know, when this uh, devices work. So this is based on ultrasound, which humans cannot hear. Of course, bats can hear or generate. Then there are some bands which are called hyperfrequency. Okay. And uh, these are uh, high frequencies, which again are uh, uh, not noticeable or heard by us, but can be used for these kind of functionalities. And this is not sound. Um, yes, but you know, it's not the uh, ultrasonic and it is a, a, a wave which is in this band, which I have shown below, you know, some three megahertz to 30 megahertz, for example, a high frequency. And it works on a similar principle. You know, it's, it keeps sending this. And the object, if it moves or a human comes in, it gets a different pattern and a moment is detected. The next one is called the microwave. Okay. Um, Hyperfrequency, microwave, radio, all these are in similar, uh, you know, technologies in different uh, frequency bands. And microwave also works on uh, sending and getting reflection. So if you see ultrasonic, hyperfrequency or microwave, they are active devices. They keep sending the rays, you know, it, it is either ultrasonic or uh, the other ones. They keep um, generating what they have to send and wait for a reflection to understand. Unlike passive infrared, which is not generating anything, it's just waiting for a heat to be generated by a moving person in a room to create that temperature difference, which it can sense. So just to you know show a summary, you know these are not very important for us. It's important for the manufacturer. Uh, they they really know uh, which bands are the ones they are using for different kind of products and other things. Today, what we will focus on is predominantly the PIR technology, okay? Which um, I would focus on for two important reasons. One is this is the most commonly used technology and a proven technology you would see across. And these are commercially, um, you can say, value for money or economical compared to all others. So this is picking up in terms of its usage and applications. Uh, even, even during COVID, you would have seen IR thermo, um, thermometers, for example. You know, wherever we go, it's like a gun and they check our temperature using that. There it is an active IR. It's sent to our body to measure the temperature. What we are talking here is a passive infrared. Let's spend some few minutes talking about this PIR technology and some key facts, you know, because um, I'm sure some of the listeners are all already using some of the products, but it's good to know the technology behind and uh, not only the facts and also the good practices to follow so that the PIR technology is harnessed well. This is more important because at the end it is always a device and an equipment. So we need to use it in a good efficient band.
So how does a PAR work? A PAR detector. As I mentioned a little earlier, this is a passive device and it doesn't consume energy while it is not functioning, which means it's just waiting for a heat to reach it in the IR band. You would have seen some movies where people are using some night vision cameras and it's showing some different color bands to see people in night. Let's assume a similar kind of a technology, you know. So uh, this is in the red band, which needs to be measured. Not measured, actually detected. It cannot really measure it. It only can detect a temperature difference. Uh, but it can only do it in the field of view. This is very important. If we actually put an obstacle in between or uh, uh, it, it has something which hides the view, then it cannot be detected. So uh, re restating this fact, because this is one of the key point in a passive infrared, it does not radiate energy for detection purposes, because overall we are talking about energy saving, reducing carbon footprint and it is not a good idea to keep sending some rays or waves you know in a room and waiting for somebody to come in and all the time consuming some energy which is also not good from a co2 point of view you know so being passive in this concept is very very good in both ways for people who would like to understand a little bit inside you know how it works um, a PR detector has got three main parts from the block diagram on the right, you could see the first one is the Fresnel lens. This is a special lens. Um, it's not it's not very um, how, how do you say that? It's not very high resolution. It's it's almost like a plastic, but it has got different patterns in it, which covers the room area or the area of detection so that it doesn't miss most of the heat which is generated within the room. That's the idea. It converges all the heat in in an infrared radiation way from the target to the sensor this will be the idea of the fresnel lens this is the first part of the um, pr detector the second one is of course the sensors and the sensors are pyroelectric sensors pyro meaning uh, fire heat so this is main part of the par sensor so sometimes par is also called as pyroelectric infrared sensor you know so it's normally called passive infrared, you know. So in a, in a industry specific, we would say it's called passive infrared sensors. So this can sense any change or a difference in temperature, which is there between the body and the room temperature. This is the key point of how the PAR works. And then, of course, a product has to have a relay and this gets triggered if there is a difference in temperature and that means there is a movement. And of course, there are some more parameters like lux and timer being added to it. But predominantly, this is the concept of how PAR works. A Fresnel lens converging to the pyroelectric sensor, which then feeds the message to the relay to take an action. So hope, hope somebody who is already using some PARs gets some understanding of how it actually works. We will see some key facts about this because um, when people are using it, sometimes people have some difficulties in terms saying, oh, it's not sensing from here. Sometimes it's not doing something somewhere. Uh, what is important to understand is it's an equipment. And the more and more um, not right ways are followed, the less and less it becomes inefficient or, or it becomes less efficient. So let's understand the key facts and what to follow normally. The first important thing is it can only detect within the detection zones, which has been specified in a technical sheet, for example, because every product has a detection zone. In this uh, uh, you know, right side picture, you can see the blue pattern that's, for example, a, a product which can do six meters in diameter, three meters radius, for example, is the detection zone. So this is the first point to be clear, which means if a room is eight meters, I cannot just put one of them, you know, probably I need to put two of them. So this is a first understanding. Second one is it has to be with the field of view. If something is blocking in between, uh, 
there is a shelf in between and it is covering up some rays for example it cannot sense any movement which it is you know uh, not in the field of view the second key point you know which is now coming is an increase in the room temperature will reduce the detection sensitivity uh, a slide earlier we all saw that the pyroelectric sensor can detect the temperature difference between the body and the room temperature how does the temperature difference happen when i move into a room i create heat anybody moves you know we create heat so this is a difference between the heat i created which is additional to the room ambient temperature is sensed by the pyro sensor now for example if the room temperature itself is almost close to my body temperature or not really body temperature if the difference is less the sensor will have difficulty of sensing that so let's say for example in our region indoors mostly are air conditioned so they work very well in the lift lobbies or also nowadays we have some air conditioning so it works well but if the same pirs are taken and put externally or even in a lift lobby which doesn't have for example air conditioning its efficiency comes down which we need to accept and understand because that's the technology behind it and the normal recommended height for installation is 2.5 meters um let's say somebody wants to install it at 3 meters yes it will still work like i said you know and a little efficiency will come down so it will also work but the recommended is 2.5 meters a little care has to be taken so that the pir detectors are not um, either facing the sunlight or close to a, a lamp or a ac vent we always say you know it's good to install the pirs at least 1 meter away from a lamp or an ac vent because that itself can create sometimes some heat or a temperature difference and then the sensor could have some false triggers and it's not very common it happens but it's good to avoid such things you know so so a care can be taken if um, a lamp or a ac vent is not close to the device uh, uh, actually a very good point i would say even though it says does not you know on a negative way it does not detect moving objects through glass it's actually a good good feature let's say for example in an office it's been installed in one of the rooms and it's having a glass wall and when somebody walks on the corridor or the outside of that room the pir does not detect them as movement and it will not switch on or switch off so this is a good thing that it filters it can only act within that room even though uh, human eyes can actually see through glass pirs don't detect beyond the glass another very important point to understand is um pirs do need at least a small motion for detection we cannot say i i am there and it's not detecting it doesn't work like that we need to move when we move we create some heat which is sensed by the pyro sensor because the more i stand still or i sit still i don't create any more a temperature difference in that whole area so it cannot detect so in a nutshell it means a small motion at least is required for movement detection in these days um, what has happened is it's not just the movement for example somebody walks into a room and there is a motion detector so which means it has detected by movement but the room has got already a glass facing the sunlight for example or a window which is external sun rays are coming in so there is enough light already in the room so why do i still need to add another lamp or a light from this lamp which is actually going against our whole wish of saving energy we'll be actually switching it on unnecessarily so a lux sensor is provided in it a lux is actually a, a unit of light intensity measurement so if we can give a particular value in the motion detector let's say for example 500 lux so only if there is a movement and a sunlight or external light less than 500 lux the light will come on otherwise there will be movement but still no light coming on this can be set 
So it's still making it more and more uh, energy efficient, let's say. And the other important point is the timer. This timer is very, very important because uh, it decides certain things, which means when I walk into a room, I need light immediate, which will happen. Yes. But I am in that room. Maybe I'm sitting for few, uh, 30 seconds, just looking at my, my laptop or I'm, I'm, I'm not moving much. And if we give a timer, which is 30 seconds, light would have gone off already. So it's not a good idea to do that way. Always keep this timer, maybe one to two minutes or two to three minutes as an optimum value. So that even if I don't move, generally, you know, some humans can keep always moving, but you know, uh, there are some places where it's not walking all the time. We sit or we stand and talk. So there are, there are certain activities we do, which it can miss us as moment. So in two, three minutes, we would move, let's say, for example, that way. So this also is a point saying when I leave the room, it will not immediately switch off. It will switch off after the two, three minutes, which we have specified in the PAR. So when we walk in, it comes on automatic immediate. When we walk out, it switches off after the last moment is detected plus the timer set. So this is how the PAR works. As I mentioned earlier, there are other technologies like ultrasonic, microwave, hyperfrequencies. Those we can say are a little more sensitive than PARs, but they are very expensive, number one. And second is they've got a lot of false triggers. Like I said, you know, they can see through glass. So if somebody walks outside, the room inside will get light. Or if some small things move inside a room, fan, for example, or, you know, I'm just giving an example, which, which it can make some objects move. Then again, you know, those technologies will create false triggers. So looking at all that, PAR is actually a very economical solution and it is very commercially viable. Having said that, we have been hearing, you know, sometimes when people say movement detectors, presence detectors. Um, uh, from an English, it means something. From a technology, it means something else. So I would like to explain it a little um, focused here so that we get the right understanding. A movement detector or a presence detector, they both need motion to detect. This is the first point and a very important point. Presence means it doesn't mean like in English, I'm present, but I don't move at all. And then the motion detector will detect me the PARs. No, they need at least a small moment to detect. Then what does moment detector mean and a presence detector mean? A moment detector predominantly means large moments can be only detected by these moment detectors, which means walking, running, maybe climbing stairs, a car coming in a car park, for example. So these are jo uh, the ones which normally are considered to be a large moments and it can be detected by the moment detectors. For example, I sit in my desk and I am working or we are in a um, washroom where we don't move like walking, running. Moment detectors cannot detect. So those places we need to use presence detectors but these still need a small moment to detect. So to be very clear, you know, I would say a PAR cannot detect a non-moving sleeping person. This makes it very clear, you know, so we cannot say I put a presence detector in my bedroom, but the light went off, for example, but maybe we slept, but it's meant to uh, go off. So this point is uh, a clear point on the PAR uh, detection. A little more on uh, technical, let's say, for people who have joined from technical side, you know, um, the PARs or uh, the relays which are used in the earlier PARs were called random switching. What it was doing is it was doing instantaneous or asynchronous switching, which means a relay will be turned on the load voltage immediately when the control voltage signals it. Um, in simple terms, when we move in, the control voltage immediately triggers that relay saying, yes, there is a moment. 
And in the older technology, in random switching, it immediately switches on. And you can see in the second curve, you know, the switching on is exactly at the same place as the control voltage. The red line on the left side indicates that. And this is generally not good because it is not at a zero level. You know, uh, we have a sine curve for all our um, AC voltage. So you can see this. Um, it's not exactly cutting at the zero. So when we use lamps which are with ballast, which is what we do recently, most of our lamps are with ballast, and this is not well suited for switching it on at any curve, which we will understand in the next slide. So what is the new technology being used? It's called zero crossing switching. And it's interesting to know for some technical people, it's called synchronous uh, switching, which means when the control voltage has detected already a moment and still it has sent a signal to the relay. The relay will wait. Don't think wait is too long. You know, it's it's micro nanoseconds, you know, but it will wait till the curve reaches zero and you see it in the red this time. There it will switch it on. So this takes care of, you know, minimizing the surge currents and it's very, very ideally well suited for the lamps with ballast for on off function. So this can be some additional information for uh, the, the electrical technical people who have joined today. Um, while we are coming close to the last sections, you know, it's, it's important to understand the PAR sensors are very often and predominantly used for lighting applications. Um, it can still work if somebody wants to use a PAR for an air conditioner through a contactor. But generally speaking, it's not a good idea because for every time somebody moves in, moves out, there will be an on and off and it's not a good way. So lighting applications are well suited for PAR applications. Having said that, people can evolve and find new applications for PAR detection movement. The first and very commonly um, you know, used lighting application is the corridor and lift lobby. We would have seen in most places recently there definitely is a minimum one light on and probably when we step out of the uh, lift, uh, five more lights come on because there is a motion detector there. So this is a very good application because um, we can say in multi-storied building or offices, not very often people are walking on this corridor if that is the case. Staircases, you can actually see um, um, let me take an example in Dubai, for example, some of the high rise buildings, they all have lifts, but they also have staircases as compulsion for emergency. And if somebody decides to walk even one floor through staircase, they go inside and they switch on the light and then they walk away. Nobody switches off. So it's not a good idea to, you know, leave it empty like that. And with one motion detector there in each floor, for example, on staircase, it can save a lot of energy. And it's also good comfort for people who open that staircase because in in uh, in the staircase rooms, it's quite dark in in uh, in the Middle East. Within offices or even homes, you know, we have some store rooms or less uh, used rooms, let's say. And there it's not good idea for us to keep a, a switch because it could be dark to search for the switch. And once we switch on, sometimes we may forget and come back and it can be all the time on. So those kind of rooms compulsorily should have a PAR motion detector as a lighting application. Washrooms these days have, you know, uh, these, uh, but it is not that all the lamps are connected to the PAR sensors for safety and uh, good reasons. One or two small lamps are through normal wiring. And the rest of the additional lamps get lit when somebody walks in. So here, you let, as I mentioned earlier, it should be a presence detector because people stand there just washing their hands or you know uh, cleaning faces. So it's not walking, running, which was the bigger moments. And also in open offices, um, it's a culture now. And also after COVID, there are people working from home, working from office. So some sections of the office are empty, some are there, some people live and come. So this kind of flexible place is very good to keep some multiple PARs. 
so that only those sections where people are working, the lights will be on, the rest can go off. Even underground parking areas are nowadays having the PARs. But one important thing to note is because it's an outdoor, or rather it's not direct indoor, an IP rating has to be properly selected. Probably IP 55, you know, and above has to be the motion detectors, which has to be chosen for this region. And it can still take care of um, the lamps in different sections whenever people walk through it or the cars come in. We saw the applications, but what are the types of PARs which can be selected for those, for example? Because there is no direct rule for this, for that, but it's very important to understand the types available and then select as per the application and the location we are going to use it. The normal ones we all know, probably have seen in many places, are the ceiling mount, which is 360 degree. And uh, there are various um, detection zones with different uh, diameters, which comes from different products and different companies. So this is one of the key product which can be chosen if it is um, a work area, for example. You see a double band of blue, which we see. The darker blue is actually a presence detection and the lighter blue is the motion detection, which means if we move the desktop or the desk to the light blue, it will not work. The presence detection can work only in this region where smaller movements can be detected. And on the edges, only large movements can be detected. If somebody wants to detect on a longer area, for example, 16 meters and 10 meters. So a good idea is to put a wall mount and it can detect sometimes, you know, with eight meters to 16 meters or 10 meters to 12 meters, for example. But um, it can also have some, you can call it um, blind spots or dead regions. You know, the zero to eight is actually a dead spot. If somebody wants to also um, have the detection in that region, a second one has to be put on the other side covering this section. So a two can cover this region, for example. Or there are motion detectors, which has got up to 16, eight to 16, but just below that, some region can also be covered. So th these are different types of motion detectors with different detection zones. So it's good to understand what we want, you know, so I'm just putting some pictures to get an understanding before you choose what you want to actually use there. Uh, let's say, for example, it is um, in underground parking area, for example, or there is a pillar or a pole uh, and, and the ceiling is too high or there are too many things on the ceiling and you cannot mount this motion detector. We can also have a wall mount with a 360 degree, which can be mounted on a pillar or a pole and have the 360 degree under, but just behind the pillar or a pole, there will be no detection. But this is a different kind of a application where it can be selected. The next one and also a very important one is called the corridor um, detection area. This one is a rectangular detection area, which is, uh, you can see it's in smaller letters, four meters by 20 meters. That's normally the way a corridor is. So four meter one side, on the other side, a very good length of 20 meters can be achieved by a 360 degree, uh, sorry, uh, by a ceiling mount uh, corridor motion detector. This is uh, getting more and more popular these days because it's clearly for this kind of an application. Uh, sometimes, you know, when people do not want to put two motion detectors or presence detectors, they can also have one with two I or a dual I, for example. So it's almost like two motion detectors inside one kept at an angle so that a longer distance is covered. So there can be more, you know, more types, but these are more or less the 90, 95% of the uh, types which are available to cover the detection zones. So by doing all this and uh, using such technologies, we did say from the starting, there will be, or the objective is to save some energy and save budget and also reduce carbon footprint. 
even though there is no direct um, calculation by saying I put one motion detector, I say $20 a month. It's not really true, even if somebody says, because it depends on the usage and also the setting which has been put. For example, if we put the timer inside set at five minutes, it can give you a different saving than if you put it at two minutes, the savings could be different. For example, I'm saying even to that extent. And in a room when some some days a lot of people come, some days a lot of people don't come, it also changes. So it's very, very flexible, but a rough estimate and an indication has been said for various re reasons, uh, re regions where it can be used to get an idea. So when we start looking at it, for example, we say when motion detectors or presence detectors are used in washrooms, the you know the common washrooms, the uh, printing places or photocopying rooms or store rooms. If today we are using 100% of X amount of energy, it can really save a 90% because there can be an error every day. Everybody switched it on and went. And because there is a motion detector, it automatically switches off and it saved a lot of energy there. Even though that room as such will be contributing only less amount of energy usage. But out of that, we are bit by bit saving. This is how uh, the whole uh, saving concept can happen. We cannot just say one lamp. What do I do? You know, no. Start with that and then a circuit, a room, a whole office. Then it adds to it. For example, the open plan offices, you know, we said it's very flexible. Some sections, people are there, not there, but all the time the whole office is on because there is nobody who wants to go and switch on, switch off. If we do that, it has resulted in 60, 70 percent energy saving. Most of the cases, it's all rough estimate, but gives you an idea why and where we need to use it. Let's say, for example, we use it in uh, corridors, staircases where people are still using, but the non usage time it will really save. So these places can have uh, maybe 50 percent of energy saving and um, some entrances, car parking areas or car. Th these places, a lot of car cars keep coming and going. So it is almost equal to better to keep it always on. But OK, you know, by putting this, we save some 20 percent. It can also be helpful. This is just an estimate and an indication. It can go vice versa. It can go, you know, in a different uh, uh, percentage. There is no hard and fast rule. It all depends on uh, usage and also the settings being done. So if I have to summarize, you know, what we have discussed today, because we are coming close to the end of the session, I would say um, a PAR motion detector is a very simple solution, you know, without any complexity, but still contributing to a lot of energy efficiency solution. And as I said earlier, the savings will be based on settings and usage, but it will definitely be there. It's only about how much we can get, but the saving is definitely there. It's also a proven technology. Um, 10, 15 years, 20 years back, probably it could have been a concept. Now it is almost like it is being used very often in most buildings. It's only that we still see probably our homes, even within many of people's offices, these motion detectors are still not used. So it should reach even there. That's the idea. And uh, it also gives a lot of comfort for the users. We step into a dark room, light comes on automatic. It's also a comfort factor. Value for money solution because the other technologies available in the same motion detection world is quite expensive. Even if you make it dual, you know, it, it still has the uh, expense high and the false triggers are still high even when you do that. So PARs are most commonly preferred for less false triggers and economical solution. It thereby reduces carbon footprint. We have spoken about it. And still, if people want to override it, it can still be done. For example, when we walk, uh, light comes on on the corridor and I know that I have given a timer of five minutes, for example, but I am still a conscious person. I can go to the switch and maybe trigger it and off. It's a temporary override. And when somebody next comes in, it will start the new cycle. It will trigger on. So this is also possible. So it's fully automatic with some temporary override, either through a switch or maybe a small remote. Nowadays, it even comes with a remote for uh, office rooms. You know, we use this in a room. 
Uh, light has come on, but I want to switch it off. I take the remote, I switch it off. It's possible. Um, this point I would stress again because this is the unique technology where the detection is done in a passive way. So which means it consumes very less energy while it's not being used, which means it's just sitting idle and passive, waiting for somebody to move and then send a radiation to it. This is much better than other devices which keep sending waves and uh, sound waves and frequencies all the time in the room. It can also be harmful to people. So this is generally the point. So when I want to summarize it, I would strongly say the usage of PAR motion detectors, mainly for lighting application is a growing trend, you know, in offices and homes. And it will continue for a long time because you still see most homes and offices have still not used and we have a potential to still use it. And it is becoming more and more economical as a solution. So I conclude my presentation here and uh, I hope this was an um, interesting and also informative session. And I leave, uh, I now um, go to the poll and the question session where I can actually answer some of your questions um, within the time limit we have actually. If I'm not able to do it either because of time or not knowing completely, we will come back to you. So we start now with this poll. And as Morris mentioned earlier, there is a, a nice Apple gift attached to it. So I wait for a few more seconds. It's not the most difficult question, but it's important to know what we spoke today. So some more are yet to um, still complete, but the poll is open. So um, others who have not completed can take a few more minutes to complete it. We now move to uh, the question answer session, which could also be key. And uh, even if it takes another five minutes more, we could uh, try and answer or discuss a few points together. Now we could start the question answer session. Okay, the first question what I see here is nowadays already smart devices using to save energy. Can uh, PAR detectors can be connected to smart devices? See smart devices is a very open term, which means um, we can even say a wireless device is a smart device or um, an integrated solution like KNX is a smart device. So the smart devices is a larger concept, but each of the device within that contributes little by little to a saving. This is very important, which means a PAR sensor will definitely be able to be connected to smart devices because there are PAR detectors which are compatible to that. Not all of them. Let's say, for example, a standard uh, standalone PAR detectors, which we spoke about very economical and easy to buy and install, don't have those features. But yes, you know, the next level ones have the brick in it, which is the, say, for example, a KNX platform. There are KNX PAR detectors, which can be integrated in the KNX world and make the whole uh, house say, or office smart, but it can be done. Yes. Okay. I don't know if I'm going in the right order, but uh, I'm taking the questions. 
do they detect any insects? Um, actually speaking, the pyro sensors which is being used inside through the Fresnel lens um, detect only a little larger temperature difference, which means it's equivalent to a, a human or let's say, for example, uh, a large dog in that room, for example, or a car, which can create such a temperature difference, it will detect. So in general, it will not detect small insects flying around, you know, so uh, you can say it will not detect insects easily. Okay, uh, this is a question where it says, you know, what will be the maximum load or amps available? Um, normally, within the PAR detectors, the relays are maximum 10 amperes to 16 amperes. You know, this is uh, inbuilt, which is very good or good enough for the lamps which are connected directly to it. It can be a single lamp, it can be a circuit of lamps. But still, a 10 amp to 16 amps is a good amount of, uh, you know, a, a load which it can handle. Say, for example, somebody wants to use an air conditioner or maybe uh, theoretically, let's say 1000 lamps connected to it. So it cannot be directly connected to it. It needs a contactor in between so that the load stays on the contactor. But the PAR will trigger the contactor and contactor will trigger the equipment. So it can be done that way. Hope I answered that question. Uh, this is a question which says, you know, if we move in PAR detectors, then what is the difference between motion sensor? I didn't fully get this question, but uh, taking this question, I would restate it. PAR detectors come in two types, motion detection and presence detection. And if you're talking about two detectors detecting, um, I can say it if both of them are connected to only one circuit each which are different then if two detectors detect me it will trigger their own circuit but it can also go to some slave master technology where you can use one detector and trigger multiple detectors also i'm not sure this question was on that but i take this opportunity to tell that so we can use a single detector to activate a single circuit of lamps or one detector behaving like master and say five detectors behaving like slave and triggering multiple circuits is also possible. Okay, I did not see this question. I almost answered this in my previous question. Is it applicable to be connected to two separate circuits? Okay, I'll answer it a little deeper here because uh, the question has been asked. Normally, one motion detector has one output. So it can be connected only to one light circuit. But if we want to do multiple, then either we look for a PAR with two circuits, but still one moment will trigger both the circuits. So it's, it's equivalent to... Um, um, not separating it because one moment it detects it triggers both the circuits what can control two separate circuits is how we spoke about maybe uh, master slave technology the master will decide it will trigger only some section of slaves to trigger some circuits this can be done but it's a bit more complex and it can be achieved actually yeah Okay, how many zones do, do you have in single detector, Fresnel lens? Okay, um, see zone is different, Fresnel lens um, 
okay let me say a zone is a collective um, region which a fresnel lens can see which means the fresnel lens has got small 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 sections you know and it's a uh, it can be sometime in a shape of a honeycomb or um, you know concentric circles inside so uh, the lens is that way and it will detect every try to detect every nook and corner of that room this is the idea actually in reality it cannot but it will try to do and not miss any of the moment and the whole thing comes together as one zone so which means it's normally a detector or a sensor with one zone unless you use a dual eye which means you are using two sensors so the pir has got two zones but it also has two uh, detectors so a detector can have one zone normally PAR can work in open sky without the rate of sensing. No. This is a clear point where if there is an ambient temperature which is higher, then the detector will get derated automatically. There is no rule or a calculation because it's an equipment based on pyro sensor. So if the heat outside is more, then it will reduce its uh, Uh, sensitivity so it's either open sky or external based on ambient temperature increase the derating will happen actually in terms of sensitivity okay um in this case contactor is mandatory for each sensor and detector actually contactor is not mandatory for each sensors if we are using it for light applications as i mentioned earlier because the 10 amps and 16 amps is good enough no contactor is required directly a motion detector can be connected to a single lamp or a set of lamps in a circuit so no contactors are required relay can take the load contactors are required only if we are going for i don't know 1000 lamps it's it's normally not the case actually or yes for a uh, air conditioner which is also not the best application but if we do that then a contactor is mandatory yes we have few more questions i'll try to finish it by 4 5 because we have just 3 minutes ahead um if we connect led light also can we connect up to 10 amps ah no 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 okay um this 10 amp normally for a relay is not the rating for the led lamp okay so this is either resistive or uh, you know our earlier lamps which is mentioned as a standard in every product but then when you open the data sheet or the instruction sheet inside most of the pars have a chart which says if you're using it with halogen lamps how much is the uh, load it can handle if you're using it with say fluorescent lamps you know how much is it if you're using it with led lamps how much is the value so this needs to be specifically checked in the instruction sheet or the catalogs before we order so led lamps is not equal to the 10 amp which i spoke that's a good point uh we have two more points questions i'll try to answer it ip44 pir sensor can it be used in covered parking areas like basement or podium levels i would suggest or recommend um ip54 minimum or 55 let's say because um it's a place where there can be dust it can be humid there can be uh, a possibility of dust or uh, water ingress so i strongly suggest ip55 ip44 42 are all indoor actually don't take uh, risk because uh, it can start working in the earlier days but then after sometimes dust can go inside or some water can go inside and they will call you back saying the product is not working so try using ip55 for those areas can we use pir detectors for fire detection absolutely no absolutely no absolutely no 
So as I mentioned, PAR detectors are to be used only for movement detection and that too, not for any emergency applications. Um, yes, in some cases they are using PAR for security purposes, which means uh, security products or PARs, which are bugler alarms are also based on PAR, but definitely not for any fire detection or emergency purposes, no. So. I think those are the questions we have and uh, within the time available, I tried to answer all of them. I hope it was uh, useful. I hand over the session to uh, Morris. Thank you. Hello everyone. Hope you had a great session. We just have one more poll, which is a satisfaction survey. If you please answer that so we can get an idea of if this topic is any good or not. Thank you. Yes, your feedback will be vital. All right, yeah, we'll end the session now. Uh, follow us on LinkedIn at Hager Middle East. And if you want to see, we might have a webinar sessions next year in 2022 again. So we will keep you updated on that on the website and on our LinkedIn. Have a nice afternoon, evening, day. Thank you so much.